Dr. Dietrich studied physics and philosophy in Hamburg. His research on complex quantum dynamics started with his PhD in Eason and continued during postdoctoral phase in Wiesmann University uh, of Asburg and MPI for the physics of complex systems. In parallel with his position as a professor of theoretical physics in the Uni National University of Columbia in Bogota, which he has held since 2000, he has enjoyed research stays in Germany, Israel, Mexico, India, and Brazil. He published on quantum pairs, chain classical method, quantum information, and random class. Thanks. I really have to, to thank both the organizers and then this audience for your understanding for the somewhat, somewhat complicated uh, circumstances of my arrival. I arrived just this afternoon at uh, three o'clock or so. Uh, here in, in Potsdam after a complicated flight from Colombia and I had to run in Amsterdam to get my connection flight to just arrive, barely arrive in time. And please uh, don't mind if I should appear a bit exhausted. It was really uh, much a party. So uh, what I'm going to talk about today is work in progress. It's not yet concluded by no means. And uh, it is a collaboration, a German, Colombian, German, Colombo German uh, cooperation between our university, Universidad Nacional de Colombia in Bogota, and uh, Technological University Dresden. And concerning uh, the, sub the subject, you mentioned that I studied also a bit of philosophy in, in Hamburg and indeed this uh, with this uh, research I return to a certain degree to my interest in philosophy because uh, it's really uh, an issue which uh, is far from any application it's a very fundamental problem and it indeed here even on uh, almost philosophical questions concerning evidence and determinants Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait. Okay. I would like to start with the uh, subject is apparently uh, this this unrelated to the is as follows. Imagine uh, a metastable particle, a particle that uh, decays into two daughter particles, but uh, it inherits to them its uh, quantum number, the total angular momentum equal to zero. So uh, it decays into two particles, and these two particles do have angular momentum, but in order to keep the total sum equal to zero, they have to leave with opposite angular moment, with opposite sign of their angular momenta, opposite directions, whatever the direction be, but it must be opposite. And this results in a strong correlation if you measure the angular momentum of one particle and the other particle, even simultaneously, it results in a perfect anti-correlation of these two signs of the two angular momentum. And Einstein argued that uh, this would not come compatible with our, let's say, classical uh, view of uh, scientific evidence. Now, there are several ways to interpret or to understand um, this quantum feature. So you see that uh, if you measure 
the uh, angular momentum individual, you get 50-50 uh, probability for both directions, but combining them, they are always anti-correlated. And this is uh, not compatible with our understanding of reality, in particular, if you take into account that these two measurements of the two angular momentum can be perfectly simultaneous. So there are various uh, alternative uh, interpretations of this uh, EPR experiment. The first one would be uh, just uh, classical correlations between the two measurements, some uh, causal relationship between the two. Next one, uh, correlations do not imply causation, as one says. There could be uh, a common cause for the two uh, measurements in particular in the form of an initial condition of a classical feature of the initial condition, which would imply these two anti-correlated uh, measurements. Or third possibility, very quantum, the two particles, the two daughter particles form a single quantum state, two qubits, but a single state. And in this way, the, <clears throat> the correlation is of a perfectly fundamentally quantum nature. The first two options, meanwhile, there have been countless experiments, let's say really high-tech uh, optics, high-tech quantum optics using last uh, <clears throat> laboratory equipment for quantum optics to uh, evidence that the first causal relation is excluded because they are really simultaneous. The second can also be excluded because uh, the correlations are so strong that they cannot be explained by any classical uh, common cause. And so the last one is the only interpretation that has been accepted by now. And it can be uh, considered, it can be entangled also uh, in terms of entanglement. Mm. There are two electrons, for example, uh, and they could form two separate qubits, two spatially separate, separate qubits, but they could also be organized in such a way that they form two qubits, but each qubit comprising part of both electrons or both particles. And it turns out that this is exactly uh, the correct interpretation for this experiment. This is just uh, a humorous uh, mm, visualization of this uh, entanglement. Mm. The problem with, in, with this interpretation is that you have to accept that there is a kind of uh, super luminal uh, correlation between the two particles that would contradict special relativity if it would imply any transmission of information. Uh, special relativity in a very precise uh, formulation says that information cannot be transmitted faster than light. But uh, if actually no, trans no information is transmitted, then you can escape uh, the verdict of uh, special relativity. And this requires that uh, it must be impossible to send a message, let's say, uh, determining in some way the result on one side and then receiving it uh, faster than light on the other side. If there is no possibility to transmit any information, then uh, you, are, uh, you are rescued. And this requires exactly that the two events, the two measurements must be completely random. In that case, you cannot determine any one of them in this way uh, it's excluded to transmit any information. And this is exactly what one finds. These two measurements, uh, the angular momentum at A and the angular momentum at B are completely, for each one itself, are completely random. So if you, for, if you, let's say, take one arm, just side A or side B, and 
count the outcomes of measurements of the angular momentum, then you find, uh, for example, uh, the binary sequence, say zero for spin down, one for spin up, and this binary sequence is perfectly random and it uh, complies with any condition with any criterion for uh, randomness. So you enter with uh, these electrons in, uh, let's say, in neutral state, for example, angular momentum horizontally with no component in the vertical direction. Then uh, you come out of this uh, <clears throat> stern gerlach magnet is a magnet with uh, a gradient in the magnetic field strength and it separates uh, two different orientations of uh, the angular momentum. So it serves to, to uh, measure angular momenta, uh, spins of electrons. And uh, finally you end up with a, a random sequence in each detector of uh, bits, spin up, spin down, and opposed in the two detectors in, in this case. Now, this should be interpreted and understood in terms of the quantum theory of measurement with this I come to the subject of the talk uh, itself. There is a famous uh, account of quantum measurement owing to von Neumann, which comprises essentially three steps. The first step is that you generate entanglement between the measured object and uh, the meter, the apparatus, which you expose this uh, object to. The next step is uh, that a quantum superposition, for example, what is called a Schrödinger cat state, a quantum superposition of two alternatives, like in this case, spin up and spin down, is turned into a classical alternative. That is, instead of uh, an entangled quantum state, you get uh, probabilities 50-50 for spin up and spin down. This is a step which uh, corresponds to a loss of quantum coherence from a quantum superposition. You come to a classical alternative, and therefore it is not, comp not compatible with unitary quantum evolution, but you can describe it uh, if uh, you consider this measurement apparatus as a macroscopic uh, system which leads to the coherence of this quantum state. This step is called the first collapse, the collapse of the wave packet, or the first collapse, according to even the old Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. And finally, however, also according to the Copenhagen interpretation, after the measurement, it is expected that the particle does again exit in a pure state spin up or spin down. So it enters, let's say, as a neutral state, as a Schrodinger cat state, and it leaves as a pure state with one or other orientation, probability 50-50, but with a given definite orientation. In formulas, uh, it looks like this. I don't need to uh, go into uh, any, any detail here, I think. Mm. And it is interesting to consider this in terms of uh, information. I already started with uh, the concept of information. And in quantum mechanics, you measure information according to von Neumann's quantum entropy, defined as uh, the trace of uh, the reduced density operator of the object mm. times its logarithm. That's uh, the most uh, appropriate quantum uh, version of uh, Shannon entropy. Now, before the measurement, the two systems, the object and the apparatus enter in pure states. So the total uh, information is zero. It's uh, both parts are in pure states. Then uh, the collapse of the wave packet leads to a mixed state. A mixed state with 50-50 probability. So it corresponds at to exactly one bit of information. And after the measurement, as I said, uh, the apparatus and the object of measurement 
leave in pure states to return again to zero quantum entropy because you have uh, only pure states. And the strange thing is that uh, apparently there is no gain of information during this process, but still you have uh, an evolution which goes from zero to a finite value of the entropy and back to zero. And this is not compatible with the unitary uh, time evolution where you can easily show that the information, the quantum entropy must be a conserved quantity, it must remain constant. Mm. Here again, uh, the same uh, situation. You uh, have uh, a pure state before the measurement with uh, a density operator for uh, the object, the measurement object, uh, the electron, which is coherent. Then uh, after passing through the stern galach after the collapse of the wave packet, you get a diagonal density operator and uh, a loss of a loss of coherence. And again, then on exit, you get uh, two alternative uh, forms of uh, the density operator, each one corresponding to a definite orientation of the spin. Now, I would like to cite a famous uh, prominent voice concerning uh, this situation and concerning the entropy balance of this process, namely Anton Zeilinger, a famous uh, Austrian quantum physicist working in particular on entanglement and, and uh, such issues. And uh, in a famous uh, trailblazing publication, he says, thus we conclude that the new information the system now represents after the measurement uh, has been spontaneously created in the measurement itself. So we conclude that uh, there, the creation of one bit per measurement takes place here, and we have to explain in view of conservation of uh, entropy, where, whence does this one bit per measurement come from. And that's uh, the object of uh, our research. Mm. The idea is that uh, it cannot come from the spin. It cannot come uh, from the spin itself because it just contains a single bit. So the only option actually to explain, from my point of view at least, to explain this creation of randomness is to uh, consider it as information borrowed from the macroscopic apparatus. And also here I can uh, cite now uh, an anonymous voice, uh, a referee uh, who was cited in turn in a recent publication on quantum randomness, where the authors cite their referee saying, in my view, all the sources of randomness originate because of interaction of the system and or the measurement apparatus within an environment. The randomness that affects pure states due to measurement is, in my view, due to the interaction of the measurement apparatus with an environment. That's exactly the thesis which we would like to, to uh, evidence uh, in this, with this uh, project. So it means that actually it's clear that in a measurement you transmit, you transfer information from the object to the apparatus, because the apparatus after the measurement knows in which state the object has been. But it's actually a two-way process as entropy information is transferred from object to apparatus. The opposite uh, transfer is also possible, namely that the object uh, goes away with certain information borrowed from the apparatus. So it's actually an exchange which takes place. And we assume that uh, this bit which is created actually comes from or is determined or at least uh, partially determined by the initial state of the environment. So uh, graphically, the situation would look like this. You start with two pure states. During the measurement, there is an exchange of information between object and apparatus. And after the measurement, the apparatus knows about the state 
of the object, but the object also is affected or knows a bit of the state of the apparatus before the measurement. Would like to uh, show that this is actually a reasonable uh, interpretation, and it requires to consider uh, a setup where the total system, object, and apparatus together form a closed system. That is a kind of measurement which appears as if going on in a closed cavity where there is no information entering or leaving uh, from outside, but inside you have. A uh, conservation of entropy and to have an exchange, as I said, between object and apparatus. So, the, let's say the meanwhile common representation of the measurement process of, in particular, the first collapse is in terms of. Uh, a statistical quantity in terms of uh, the reduced density operator of the measurement object. And this approach does not allow to look into the apparatus itself or to check any interchange of information between object and apparatus. We would like to take uh, a unitary approach to describe this total closed system in terms of unitary quantum mechanics, of quantum mechanics determined by the Schrodinger equation. But the problem is, of course, that uh, apparently uh, the collapse, the first collapse of the wave packet, cannot be described in the framework of unitary time evolution because it leads to a loss of coherence. However, just recently, there is uh, an interesting, attractive way out in the form of what is called a finite heat path. A heat path is the usual uh, term used by theoretical physicists for the description of macroscopic objects. You uh, postulate a path that is uh, a huge number of harmonic oscillators, for example, with a quasi-continuous spectrum, and coupling a system to such a big, uh, large number of harmonic oscillators, you can achieve, in effect, uh, decoherence. And it has been shown recently that, uh, of course, that's possible. But uh, in fact, it's not necessary to, let's say, literally go let the number of harmonic oscillators or other systems uh, go to infinity. You can do with a large but finite number. A large but finite number of uh, systems you couple the central system to is a challenge for the computer. It's a challenge for numerical uh, computations. But meanwhile, we are so advanced with our hardware and software that we can do it. And this means that with a uh, large but finite heat path, you can simulate uh, decoherence in a unitary framework. This is uh, an approach that has been proposed uh, and, and uh, let's say, uh, checked by our colleagues in, in Dresden, and we collaborate with them to apply this finite path approach to the measurement problem. Here are uh, a few graphics uh, taken from a publication of these uh, colleagues in Dresden, where you see in terms of different, let's say, diagnostics, uh, in terms of the dissipation rate, of the purity, uh, of the energy decay and, and the Markovianity or non-Markovianity of the system, that indeed, if you let's start, start with a number n of very few, one, five, 10 harmonic oscillators, you get a typical unitary uh, time evolution with uh, collapses and revivals. But if you increase, uh, the number further to a few hundred, for example, uh, and you can do that in numerical uh, calculations, you obtain all the features of uh, a non-unitary time evolution of decoherence, even if you can be sure that on very, very long time scales, you will see deviations. But for all practical purposes, uh, this approach, this numerical approach is viable and we decided to apply it to our 
case to, to a, a model of the measurement. And the plan then is to numerically simulate the total system object plus meter plus operators environment uh, in a Hamiltonian way and to let the number of coupled harmonic oscillators, the number n of coupled harmonic oscillators go not to infinity, but to large values and to see whether we can somehow find evidence uh, for this role of the environment, which I indicated uh, just a moment ago. So uh, this is the model. Uh, we use uh, the model Hamiltonian, which comprises uh, two ter uh, three terms. We do not do this uh, separation, which is traditionally uh, approved between object and meter and apparatus. We merge apparatus and meter into a single system so that there's only a single coupling Hamiltonian. Uh, we have HO for the object, uh, for example, spin, like here, uh, with party operator sigma x. Uh, an environment just a sum over harmonic oscillators and a coupling which couples a different component of the spin. For example, if the self energy is sigma x, then we use sigma z in the coupling with uh, the coordinate position, for example, of these harmonic oscillators. And uh, concerning the initial state, this is also uh, uh, a delicate issue. We would like to start with a pure state. And this means that the environment cannot be in a thermal state, literally, but it has to be in a state which uh, is close to a thermal state, but still is uh, a pure state. You can do that, this uh, by, uh, for example, using a superposition of uh, coherent states for the harmonic oscillators. And then what we expect is the following situation that if uh, you just have a single harmonic oscillator, single boson mode, you get very regular, Oscillations, for example, if you increase this number n of harmonic oscillators, you get something more irregular, comprising uh, collapses and revivals. And increasing this number n further, you would go to a situation where these collapses and revivals are very irregular and for a very long time scale until, uh, let's say, for a sufficiently large number, you would get uh, a situation where the object indeed would more or less straightly go to spin up or spin down without returning to uh, a pure to, to uh, a neutral state, at least on uh, relatively shorter time scales. So, in terms of uh, what is called the Bloch sphere, which is uh, a way of graphically representing the density operator of uh, a spin, you would expect uh, a behavior like this: that if you start in a neutral state. This means uh, being on the uh, equator of this block sphere. The spin should uh, move, first of all, that's the usual unitary time evolution of the spin. It should rotate, but at the same time, it should uh, go up to the North Pole or it should go down to the South Pole, South Pole corresponding to measurement results, spin up or spin down. And I would like to conclude with uh, some real numerical simulations here. Of, <clears throat> here. First of all, uh, these uh, thermal states in quotation marks, which I mentioned as uh, the initial states of the heat bath, these are the centroids of coherent states, which we define for each oscillator, and they are distributed around zero, so that the average is indeed zero of the angular momentum, but with a certain spread. Uh, into the phase space of what is the analog of phase space for the classical system, for the quantum system. And these centroids chosen with some uh, random generator ch chosen at random. And now here are the simulations. I hope they work. You see that uh, in some cases uh, the spin indeed uh, goes up. Also here, 
doing all kinds of uh, also random uh, oscillations and movements uh, in between on the way uh, to the pole. Here's another. In other cases, of course, uh, statistically the same number, uh, it goes down. Is another way it uh, goes down. And there are indeed some cases where uh, it does not go to the poles. In the majority, let's say 60% uh, of the cases or more, it uh, goes up or down to, to one of the poles, but there are also cases where it does not go to one of the poles. <clears throat> this uh, dark sphere in the middle is in the graphical language of uh, the block sphere, indicating the degree of coherence. So if uh, the size of the, the arrow on the surface or within the block sphere uh, is close to one, the system is in, a, in an approximately pure state. If it goes to zero, uh, it is completely depolarized or completely decoherent. So in some cases, indeed, uh, the measurement has a nil result. It doesn't uh, result in any uh, definite final outcome in contradiction clearly to the Copenhagen interpretation. And finally here are, uh, let's say records of uh, measures of entropy, uh, the partial entropy of the spin and the linear entropy of purity. And you see that uh, indeed as indicated in this uh, let's say general approach, in most cases, it starts at zero, then rises, co corresponding to the first collapse of the wave packet, and then goes down again to zero, or closely close to zero, corresponding to what is called the second collapse, this uh, pure state outcome of the measurement. And in some cases, like the last uh, simulation, which I showed to you, uh, it goes to, to one and uh, stays there. And this just as a kind of not, uh, kind of conclusion which should not be taken seriously, but uh, the objective of this project is clearly to uh, allow us uh, a new view on quantum randomness as generated in quantum measurement of spins. Thank you. Yeah. could change and regard it as neutral on the inside layer of phosphorescence. Because um, I think uh, we probably have changed on the phosphor. And very complex possible effects for me, probably changed. And in this case, going back to the very complex clock, we changed phosphor and phosphorus and that, and here we have to do that. Well, I would I would agree in, uh, in, if you interpret your statement uh, in terms of uh, not let's say naked electrons, but electrons always embedded in uh, a context in a few particle context, let's say in a small system or even uh, as coupled to uh, a large microscopic system, then. Of course, the electron attains uh, lots of additional properties, but these properties are, uh, let's say, at least partially owing to this larger environment, which, so to speak, blows up the, the naked uh, two-state system to something which is effectively uh, like a larger system. In that sense, I would agree with you. Okay. Thank you.
Uh, interpretation of the electron density in the uh, frame of uh, the city of nuclear um, electrons in TV, that is here, and then the whole. But what is your name about the clear? What uh, is interpretation? Because no book is something having this is simply the story is infinite. What uh, how we can inter interpret even if you there are part of virtual particles continue to be real again uh total energy will be increased. Well I I hear don't consider electrons particularly in the solid state context. So I'm not talking about electrons in in, uh, in iron lattice or anything like that, where you would have, uh, let's say, uh, electrons as quasi-particles within a cloud of uh, um, excite, excitations of uh, the, the solid state. I'm talking about naked electrons, but not completely naked, because in the measurement, they must be coupled to even possibly weakly coupled to uh, some environment just in order to see them. I mean, if you if you consider them as completely isolated, then you you uh, you don't uh, even you are not even able to measure anything because measurement indeed requires some transmission of information of the state of the electron to to some uh, larger system to, to get registered to get uh, macroscopically visible. And uh, this may be weak coupling, in fact, embeds the electron into uh, 